Let's turn our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 8. We'll go through chapter 8 and chapter 9, hopefully tonight. I know we went through one chapter last week. Are there good men? Are there good women in the world? Or are all just sinners? Which statement is correct? I hear that phrase quite often used by parents or loved ones. Oh, he's a good boy. Or she's a good boy or good girl. (laughs) That's not unusual in today's day and age. (laughs) You know, but my child's not bad. My child's not evil. But in reality, the Bible is clear that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, huh? And we're all sinners. We're all sinners. That word sin is is um, abrasive, maybe even offensive to some because we don't like to be told that we're sinners and that we've done something wrong contrary to God's principles. Oftentimes the world will say, no, it's contrary to your principles, uh, your ideas, your ideologies and so forth, and you're trying to push your stuff on us. And that's offensive to us. You know, leave us alone. We don't, we don't need your moral values. We don't need Christ. There is no God. We want to live the way we want to live. You're saying that this is, this is wrong, this is immoral, and we're saying it's not. And so who's, who's to say? And so they get offended from the sin itself. The word sin itself basically means missing the mark, right? It's, it's the Hebrew and the Greek term that means that God has set a standard and we've missed that standard, basically. Now, that's not as offensive. We missed the mark. We, we, we use the word mistake. We made a mistake um, back during the times when um, kings were kings and so forth. They would have archers, and they would practice by putting um, targets out 100, 200 yards or so forth, and then the archers would take their bows, and they would pull back on the string, and then they would shoot their arrows at the target, and they had a center in the target, usually a red dot of some sort or an X to show that that was the center of the target. And their objective was to pull back that string and hit the center of that target. And they were right on target. And if they missed, they said, you missed the mark. In other words, you sin, you sin. Some have suggested that it's, it's, it's the line in, in sports where it's a foul you know, you play baseball and, and you hit that that ball, and as it goes towards left field, it goes a little too too far to the left, and it's out of bounds. It's a foul, or sometimes they would say it's, it's a sinner. It missed the mark. It missed the mark. That's what sin is: is missing the mark. You go back to Genesis, and you see the whole account of Adam and Eve, and God directing Adam exactly uh, what he can do, and that is have of anything that he wants, of everything that he wants, except for one thing, and that was that tree of knowledge of good and evil. That was the one thing that he could not have of everything else uh, that, that God had created. I'm thinking of a quote here. I, I think it was by, by Mark Twain who said that it's interesting how we can have everything but feel like we don't have nothing when there's one thing denied to us. You know, isn't that interesting? If someone tells you, don't do that or don't go in that room, something in our brain clicks, you know, like a little time clock and says, why can't I go in there? Who says I can't go in there? I'm going to go in there. What's going to happen if I go in there? And so we become rebellious uh, to the directions and, and we don't obey and we end up going in there and then we find out there's a boogeyman in there, you know? Something's going to eat us up. You know? And we were told not to do that. But there's something about, you know, that little sign that says, do not step on the grass. And what do we do? We go and step on the grass because we just want to be defiant. You know, that's our sinful nature. God said, look, uh, of everything in the world is all yours. <laughs> you can have everything. Just don't eat this one tree. I kind of wonder, and and this is all supposition, but I kind of wonder, you know, here we are in California, Israel is way over there, you know, and that's where they they were at, Euphrates River, wherever that is now, the flood, we don't know exactly where it's at now because it all got covered up. But you just have to ask yourself, was the tree like visible to them? And if it was, why didn't they move further away from it so that they weren't tempted every morning? I can see them waking up going, oh, there's a tree we can't touch, we can't eat, oh boy. 
You know, why not move somewhere else so that you don't see it and then you're not tempted by it? And then I kind of wonder if every, every day they moved closer and then moved closer and moved closer. And of course, we know the story that the serpent came along and tempted, tempted Eve um, to eat of that uh, fruit and she ate of it. I have a quote here by Chuck, and I can't pronounce his last name. I'm going to even try. But he said, Did perpetual happiness in the Garden of Eden uh, maybe get so boring that eating the apple was justified? You know, it was the last thing that they could do. <laughs> maybe they thought they could do it. Now, we know that the Bible says that the woman was tempted by the serpent, and the woman ate of the fruit first and then gave the fruit to Adam and then he ate of that fruit. Now the question arose a, a while back uh, by some of us here as to who sinned first. Was it Adam or was it the woman that sinned? And that's, that's a pretty good question, isn't it? The Bible doesn't say who sinned first. The Bible does say in, in Timothy that Adam was formed first and then Eve. And so Adam being formed first and then God giving him directions of what not to eat of and what to eat of then his responsibility was then to teach his wife what she could eat of and not eat of, being the head of his home. And we know that the man is the head of the home in Corinthians is very clear. God created man first, and then he created Eve. Adam became the life-giving being, uh, just like the last Adam became the life-giving spirit, Jesus Christ, speaking of Jesus Christ. But nowhere in Scripture does it say that Adam sinned first. But we know that because of Adam, um, sinning brought death into the world because he was responsible for his household. And so through Adam, being the head of his home, being the covering, took the responsibility of bringing sin into the world. Adam was not deceived, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2.14, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. That's interesting. So yes, the woman... Sin first. She fell into transgression. But sin came through Adam. The judgment of sin came through Adam because he was the head of his home. In Leviticus, and I don't know exactly where it is, it just came to mind, but in Leviticus, you remember reading Leviticus, right? It's that book that you don't like to read too much. But it talks about um, a husband who is not in the home, and if a wife goes out and makes a oath or takes an oath and so forth and, and binds the household, that if the man was uh, aware of it, then it was binding because he was aware of it. Now, if he was not aware of it, then it wasn't binding in a sense because he's the head of household and she went out and made an oath or a deal without his knowledge of it and thus because he didn't have knowledge of it, then it wasn't binding. Now that says something about the, the place of women at that time. It's nothing like that today. They are more than binding today. <laughs> God has, has liberated them greatly, and not the uh, feminist movement, by the way. So we see sin. Sin is a terrible thing. Sin is the thing that has destroyed Adam and Eve. Sin is a thing that destroys us. And we all sin and fall short of God's glory. And we continue to sin. Sin is a part of our lives. We can't get away from that sin. It is sin that draws us to Christ because we know it is our sin that has demand justice, which is death because of our sinfulness. The nature is in such a way that we have a tendency to always sin. And so there is no hope for us. There is no eternal salvation based upon our own works or labor because we're at heart sinful creatures. We have to come to terms with that. And so what happens is, is that Christ comes into the scene and while we were still yet sinners, Christ died, on, died for us because he loved us. And so he set the way to forgive our sins. And so our sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. They have been forgiven. The penalty had been paid. The debt was paid. The sentence was paid already. So now, even though we're still sinners, God doesn't look at us as sinners. He looks at his son as the one paying the debt for our sin. And that's an amen, isn't it? Isn't that a wonderful thing? Because even though... Um, we came that way to Christ, we continue to live that way in Christ, don't we? As sinners, we fall short. Uh, we don't always do the right thing. We, we continue to, 
to uh, have idols in our lives. We continue to be rebellious and we continue to be disobedient to the Lord. And yet, because we have this relationship with God who requires that we confess our sins on a daily basis, who requires that our hearts are, are not to sin, but that our hearts are trying to push sin away from our lives because we're trying to grow through it, but our hearts are not hardened so that we don't tell God about our sins. We're open with it to the Lord. He is our Father. He's our priest that we confess to our sins and our faults and our shortcomings so that hopefully we find forgiveness within the sin that's in our lives. So in chapter 8, we find Judas' insensitivity to sin. And that's important for us to understand because there is an insensitivity to sin. When... um, I'm trying to think, and I don't know the procedure when, today, what it is. I think it's more of just just sewing you up when you go and get into an operation. But there was a time when you got cut, I would say during the, the time of the cowboys and Indians type of thing. If you got cut, they would take a branding iron or something hot, and they would literally cauterize you know, the, uh, the wound. I guess they do that in, in surgery also. If blood vessels and so forth are bleeding, they, they take this little instrument and just cauterize the end of it to stop the bleeding. And that's what has happened to Judah. They are, they are cauterized. Their hearts are cauterized to sin. They're insensitive to sin. Um, they don't believe it to be sin anymore. Or if it is, they've pushed it by the side that they're not thinking about it. And of course, if it's out of mind and, and out of sight, then I don't have to think about it. And, and we have to understand that that's not what God wants. He wants us to always be aware of our sins, our shortcomings to examine ourselves. Are we walking in the faith? Corinthians tells us that. Examine yourselves. Where am I at? I think I told this story to the men's, but I didn't tell it to the church. Uh, My PT Cruiser broke down. It looks like I might need a whole new engine in it. So praise the Lord. Um, (laughs) Praise God. He's good. I don't know how, but he's going to take care of it. He already has. Um, but I was waiting on the freeway just off, uh, off of just past 60th Street before Limonite, waiting for the tow truck. He finally came, so he's starting to hook me up. And this patrol, the highway patrol comes up, and he's, you know, burling down the freeway. He's going 55, probably sees us there. And so he stops, and of course, dust is flying everywhere and getting all over me and so forth. So I turn my back, and, you know, his lights are on me. And he's sitting in his vehicle. And the guy's hooking me all up, and I'm waiting for him to get out, you know, to say, hey, are you guys okay? Is everything fine? And, you know, be helpful, you know, like a police officer should. <laughs> Caring and loving and, and so forth. But he, he didn't do any of that. He just sat in his car, and then all of a sudden he took off after a good, I would say a good uh, three, four, five minutes maybe. And I'm, I'm just looking at the, the truck driver and going, what was that about? He goes, I don't know. I think he was checking out my license plate. He was running it, you know, in his system. And he was, he was probably seeing if there was something that I had done that he could get me on. Maybe there was a warrant, you know, or maybe there was a ticket I didn't pay. And so he'd tell the truck, the towing truck guy, take it to the yard, you know. And there I'm stranded. Of course, he won't give me a ride home. You know, and I'm just thinking of all these things that possibly, and that's probably what it was. And of course, when he looked at my vehicle license plate and checked out all the tickets I had, he saw that I was clean and that I was perfect. And I know that's the truth. I have, my record is spotless because I got pulled over over here and I, I got caught. And, and when he pulled me over, he actually ran and he goes, your, your record's spotless. I can't, I can't taint that. He goes, don't, don't do this again, otherwise you'll taint your record. So I know it's spotless, but I still sin. And the police officers, police officers was checking to see if I had sin in my life, right? And, and as I was thinking of all this, the Lord just kind of reminded me, that's how we should be in our own lives. Looking up on the computer, check, okay, where's Reuben's heart today? You know, what are you doing? What do you need to do? What do you need to stop doing and so forth? Are you in sin today? Because we are in sin every day. If you know to do good and you don't do it, the Bible says it's sin. It's sin. And so we should, before we go to bed every night, confess our sins before the Lord. You know, don't let the, don't let your, uh, don't let the sun go down upon your anger, you know, in a, in a sense. Don't let the sun go down on your sin. 
We should confess our sins always before the Lord. It's what he wants. If we do not confess our sins, then we will get into trouble because God then has to chastise us to get us to be open to at least observe what we're doing on a daily basis. How did we handle that situation? How did you speak to that person? Where is your heart when you deal with people? Why are you so angry at them? Why do you dislike them so, you know? Uh, those type of things that God wants you to get rid of, you know, completely. And so we come to chapter 8, and he talks a little bit about this. At that time, says the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of the princes and the bones of the priests, the bones of the prophets, the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. They shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven which they have loved and which they have served and after which they have walked, which they have sought and which they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered nor buried. They shall be like refuge on the face of the earth. Then death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of those who remain of this evil family, who remain in all these places or the places where I have driven them, saith the Lord of hosts. So the bones of the priests, of the prophets, are all unburied. And that's the Lord's doing. So that they remember what they have done. You know, they still do that today. When they took over Gaza, and and the Muslims took that area over, they literally unburied everybody. So we don't want any Jews here. And they unburied everybody and made them move them all out from the area. You know, I find that interesting. It's still something that happens to this day. That's what God did. So Judah then uh, turns to his own, uh, his own ways. Moreover, you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, will they fall and not rise? Will one turn away and not return? Why has this people slid in back, Jerusalem in a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit and refuse to return. I listened and heard, but they... Do not speak aright. A man repented of his wickedness says, What have I done? Everyone turns to his own course as the horse rushes into battle. Even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed time, and the turtle dove, the swift and the shallow swallow, observe their time of their coming. But my people do not know the judgment of the Lord. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Look, the false pin of the scribe certainly works falsehood. A wise man are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? Uh, Interesting that they have rejected the word of the Lord. That's really where it starts, rejecting the word of the Lord. This is God's word and he has written it to us so that we know truth. We understand his will and his ways. And when we begin to reject it, that's when we get into trouble. They had rejected the will of the Lord, the word of the Lord. How do you reject the word of the Lord? By not doing it. One, by not believing it. That's a big issue. Well, I don't believe that part of it. You know, if there's a certain part that's not true in the Bible, then I'm going to go throw this thing in the trash can because then I don't believe any of it. Because it's useless. Then what other parts are, are not true? You know, if you can tell me that there's one section here that's wrong, then there's got to be other sections that are wrong. I, I cannot accept that at all. In, in my own mind and in my own heart, I cannot accept that this thing has flaws or errors in it. Because if it does... <laughs> then I'm wasting my time here because I'm teaching from a book that has a bunch of errors and flaws and we can't depend on it or even trust in it. And so I can't accept that. So what I have determined in my own heart is that this w- book, this word, this Bible is 100% accurate. There's no errors in it and everything that it says is right on. Whether I believe it, whether I you know, accept it, whether I like it or whether I am offended by it, it's still 100% accurate. And that's the way I want to live. If I don't, then I'm out of (laughs) here really fast because then there is no heaven and there is no God. Because I've read the other books and there's errors in them all over the place. 
but this is the only book that I don't find any errors. And so that's the first step of backsliding is, is not receiving his word, but rejecting it. So what wisdom do they have? Therefore, I will give their wives to others and their fields to those who will inherit them because from the least even to the greatest, everyone is given to covetousness. From the prophets even to the priests, everyone deals falsely for they have healed the hurt of the daughters of my people slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abominations? No. Were they not all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush? Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. In time of their punishment they shall be cast down, says the Lord. Now Judah asks, where is the Lord? Here in verse 13. I will surely consume them, says the Lord. No grapes shall be on their vines, nor figs on their fig trees. And the leaf shall fade. And the things I have given them shall pass away from them. Why do we sit still? Assemble yourselves. And let us enter the fortified cities. Let us be silent there. For the Lord our God has put us to silent. And given us water of gold to drink. Because we have sinned against the Lord. We looked for peace but no good came. And for a time of health and there was trouble. The snorting of The horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighboring of his strong ones. For they have come and devoured the land, all that is in it, the cities and those who dwell in it. For behold, I will send serpents among you, vipers which cannot be charmed. And they shall bite you, saith the Lord. I would comfort myself in sorrow. My heart is faint in me. Listen, the voice, the cry of the daughters of my people from far countries. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images with foreign idols? The harvest is past. The summer is ended. In other words, the end is near. The end is near. You know, we just had the summer, the, the summer fest and the harvest has passed and the summer is ended. So we're closer to the end, aren't we? We're closer to the end. And you look around and you have to say, wow, uh, I just um, read several articles, things that are going on, some new lawsuits against businesses. Uh, they're asking uh, them to pay fines because they're not um, allowing same-sex couples to go in and use their grounds uh, to get wed. And so their, their courts are making them pay each couple $1,500 fines for not allowing them. And there's another lawsuit in Kentucky uh, similar to that case. Uh, Texas, where, where it's supposed to be the Bible Belt. It's supposed to be where, where the strong believers and Christians are. And now this one mayor who is uh, uh, lesbian uh, has decided that she wants to see uh, how many famous pastors out there are are really um, haters. So she has demanded through court that they all give her their sermons. And they're going to go through every sermon to see exactly what they've said about same-sex marriage, about homosexuality, and so forth. This is happening right now. Right now. This is the kind of stuff that the world is preparing to do against those that are haters because we're not christians in their eyes and and this is what's so deceptive the enemy is so good is that you have now christians who are now coming out saying it's okay it is okay to be homosexual it is okay god loves them he accepts them they're going to heaven in fact they are christians and so because you have these men these churches these denominations saying that, then you have an extreme Christian group, the conservatives like us that believe the Bible, they're the terrorists. We need to get rid of them. We need to get rid of them. And it's getting close to home. It's getting close to home. Not Calvary Chapel, but affiliated, related to Calvary Chapel, very close. A man who has just come out and embraced the whole same-sex marriage. They mentioned um, Lonnie Frisbee, who was a part of the hippie movement. Chuck had used him. 
in a mightily way. And then later on down the road when he, he kind of rebelled against the Calvary movement and went towards the vineyard and then they got rid of him because he was just so extreme. And then it turned out he, he ended up dying of AIDS because he was a homosexual. And this individual was saying, here is a man that just loved Jesus. He loved Jesus and God used him in great ways. And they just said, I just can't believe that he's not a Christian and he's not in heaven. I don't know. I can't judge that. I don't know his heart when he passed away. I don't know. But the Bible is clear that if you practice these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You can't get away from that. And so there's that possibility. I'm not going to say that because they're doing all these great things that they're a Christian. Because you'll go knock, knock on the door. And of course, that's not a literal knock. You know, there isn't a door in heaven that you, we all get up there and we've got to knock. He, he's, he's giving us a metaphor that when we get to heaven, God's going to pretty much know that we're not his because we're really workers of iniquity. Because our lives really haven't brought forth fruit, a harvest of good fruit in the Lord. But as we look around, and it's going to get worse and worse, there's, there's lawsuits right now trying to take away benefits from pastors so that it makes it harder for them to be pastors. Because if you hit them in the pocketbook, then they can't do that. And then they've got to do something else and so forth. Um, I Don't quote me on this, but <clears throat> there's something like twelve to 1,500 pastors quitting every year, quitting the ministry because of what's going on. And of course, uh, many of those have fallen too, and we've known that here recently. So the harvest has passed, the summer has ended, so you know that the end is near, and we are not saved, and we are not saved. What a, what a implication of their own you know, sinfulness, right? And we're not even saved. They understood where they were at, and they're walking the Lord because of their, their idolatry. Verse 21, for the herd of the daughters of my people, I am hurt, I am mourning, Astonishment has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no recovery for the health, O daughter of my people? I mean, God is literally crying for them. Crying for them. I think of Jesus sitting there overlooking Jerusalem and then weeping for it. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I wish to gather you as a hen gathers its chicks, but you would not. You, know, you kill and persecute the prophets. And then it would be shortly after that that they would take Jesus and crucify him upon the cross, Jerusalem, entering with millions of people coming to offer up a sacrifice in the Passover day, and they would take him, the true Passover, and crucify him. If Jesus weeped and cried over the people in their sin, then God here weeped and cried over his people, Israel and Judah, because of their sin. What a heart, what a God we serve. One that weeps because we sin, because we reject the word of God. And so, like God, we become weeping prophets in a sense. How many of you have ever weeped over sin how many of you ever felt dirty because of sin? I mean, there's those times where you're just like, man, you, know, you, want, you want to go in the shower and you start scrubbing and scrubbing, going, how can I be so sinful? I've been there. Just scrubbing and then I'm all clean and red and you're like, I still feel it. Disgusting. You know? And God weeps over that. How many of us have weeped over our sin lately? A sin that we're involved in. It's a hardened heart that doesn't weep over the sin that we're in. And so like God, his people, who are his people, they begin to weep too over sin. <clears throat> you know, I haven't felt that weeping in a while. When I first got saved, I used to go witnessing out downtown Riverside quite often and just stayed really busy serving the Lord in, in those areas and, and a lot of praying, a lot of weeping for lost people. Uh, I always could see the lost people, especially when I was working. I, I viewed everybody as a lost person, always took opportunities to somehow share with them, you know, find a word, a phrase that they said, and boom, I, I snuck in there and shared the gospel, you know, because they opened it up and so forth. And in these latter years, you know, preaching it every day and looking for those opportunities, it continues on. But but the weeping, you know, I, I don't think I've wept as much uh, as then, 
as with the summer fest. Every time I'd go out there on Friday night for those 11 weeks, you know, going out there, just looking at the little kids, you know, those little Mexican faces, those little girls with long black hair and running around and getting their nails and their faces painted. And I'm like, man, Lord, you just got to tell them that Jesus loves them. It was just such a neat feeling that, that we were there to let them know Jesus loves them. He cares for them. I just want it so badly that they just come to the Lord and then I start hearing the little stories here and there of fruit and people coming to the Lord and it was like, wow, this is exactly what it's all about, Lord. But the fact of just watching them all there at the park and we were there and we were intermingled with their lives and we were representing Christ and they could not understand all that. That was such a neat thing that was taking place at that moment, the spiritual warfare and yet the, the spiritual blessings and fruit that was there, we won't know it until we get to heaven, what God is going to do there. We won't know it because we don't know how we impacted their lives. And one day, maybe 10 years from now, one of those little kids will go back and remember, I remember when I was going to a park, there were these bunch of people, they're just giving away hot dogs. What was that about, you know? And they open up the Bible because God leads them to the word and they realize this is what it was all about. You know? Weeping for the lost. Weeping for the sins of the world. What's going on? <clears throat> Every time I hear of a story of Isa beheading somebody. And then recently somebody was, was really disgusted as they were sharing it. They, I guess Glenn Beck showed some videos of them taking babies and children and just crushing their heads. And it's like, how can you do that? How can, how can you? I can't even imagine somebody doing it. To have so much evil in you that you would do that to a little baby, a little child, that's crazy. That is crazy. We should be weeping over those things. We should be on our knees praying. And so... Jeremiah begins to weep or lament as a prophet, just like his God. And so these first two verses um, reveals his heart. He says, oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had a, in the wilderness a lodging place for travelers that I might leave my people and go from them for they are all adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. That's his heart, wow. That's how we ought to view sin. Disgusting. We should be weeping over it. The adulteress. And it's not talking about adultery. It's talking about spiritual adultery against God. Forgetting his word and being obedient to it. Going our own way in our own path. That's, that's, that is, I really believe that's the ultimate idolatry. Is thinking you know the best way and God doesn't know. That's an insult. You know, that is an insult. To tell God, no, you really don't know what you're doing. So I'll tell you what, I, I'm going to do it for you. Here's my plan and it's going to work. Really? Really? How many of us would, would just give our car keys to our little kids? Yeah, go ahead. Give me your plan. I, you know better than I do. It's ridiculous. It sounds ridiculous. We wouldn't even entertain that thought. And yet, here we think that we know better than God to tell him how it should be done. That's idolatry because you put yourself in the place of God. The ultimate. He goes on and says, And like their bow, they have bent their tongues for lies. They are not violent for the truth on the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, saith the Lord. Everyone takes heed to his neighbor and do not trust any brother, for every brother will utterly supplant and every neighbor will walk with slanders. Everyone will deceive his neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have taught their t tongue to speak lies. Uh, they weary themselves to commit iniquity. Isn't it amazing that, that even happens? Everything's a lie, right? We're so used to lying that we just lie naturally now. As soon as somebody asks us a question that, that, that is um, 
revealing, we lie almost immediately. In the business world, lying is, is accepted and encouraged if you can get away with it. Remember, I had a boss one time, and I caught him in a few lies, and I just right out said, you're lying to me. That's an outright lie. And he goes, Reuben, it's expected in, in corporate America. Don't worry about it. You know, I'm like, well, I, I am worried about it. I don't like it. I'm not lying to you. Why should you lie to me? And they expect that. Lying is expected. Kids lie all the time to their parents because they don't want to get caught. Think of my son when he was sharing the testimony. I'm like, how many lies could, did he tell just to cover all that up? You know? Uh, cover all that sin up, you know, a lot of lies, a lot of lies. And they lied, they lied to their neighbors, they lied to their friends. No one was talking the truth to anyone. Bunch of liars. <laughs> I don't know who to believe. <laughs> and that's why I don't believe anyone and trust no man but God alone. Yeah. God is good. No, the Bible tells us, though, that love hopes in all things, love trust. And so we need to do that and give everyone a benefit of the doubt. Your dwelling place is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, says the Lord. Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will refine them and try them. For how shall I deal with the daughter of my people? Their tongue is an arrow shot out. It speaks deceit. One speaks peaceably. Did I already read that? To his neighbor, his mouth, his heart lies in wait. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Verse 9. I shall, shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? I will take up a, a weeping and willing, a wailing for the mountains and for the dwelling places of the wilderness, a, a lamentation, because they are burned up so that no one can pass through, nor can men hear the voice of the cattle, both the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the fields. They are gone. I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, a den of jackals. I will make the cities of Judah desolate without the inhabitants. I mean, they pretty much destroyed it completely, just stripped it dry, you know. And Jeremiah's seen all this, and he's recording it all, and he's literally sick to his stomach watching it all happen as he's weeping and crying because of this substitute for religion and faith in Jesus Christ and God because of their idolatry. And they were very much unresponsive to Jeremiah. That's the sad part. You know, our nation is so hardened to the truth anymore that nobody even knows what truth is. The enemy has done a great job at it. That's why it's so important to read your word. It goes on in verse 12. Who is the wise man and who may understand this? And who is he whom the mouth of the Lord has spoken that he may declare it? Why does the land perish and burn up like a wilderness so that no one can pass through it? And the Lord said, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them and have not obeyed my voice, nor walked according to it. Why? Simply because they have forsaken my law. They have not obeyed my voice. They're not walking with me. Now I looked up the word not obey there because I just thought, okay, obey. That's one of their, their problems. They just weren't obedient to the Lord. The Lord was clear in his word, but they didn't want to hear it, and they did their own thing. And so I looked it up, and throughout the whole Bible, it's used more times in Jeremiah than any other place. Ten times in Jeremiah. and all the other books, maybe one or two times it's used. I find that interesting because that reveals the hardness of Judah's heart at that time was so hard that they would not obey the voice of the Lord. Just wouldn't do it. And that's a sad place to be in your walk with the Lord. <clears throat> Have you ever met someone that's blind spiritually? That they don't see the sin that they're in, but others can see it so clearly. And you just kind of scratch your head like, what is wrong with them? Where are they really at that they can't see this? I have a, a friend, and I, I consider him a really good friend. We got along really well. But the guy just has made some really bad mistakes when it comes to relationships. And he would get married and get into these relationships and then get divorced. 
And they were all relationships that were unequally yoked. And then he would cry, why am I going through this? Why is God doing this? You know, the enemy is attacking. No, it's your choices that you're making, your disobedience to God's word. And then just recently again, he got hooked up with another, another girl. Now she's pregnant, had a baby. And he's talking about, oh, I need some prayer. The enemy's really attacking me. I'm in this unequally yoked situation. I go, the enemy's not attacking you. You're attacking yourself. You're bringing this on yourself. Wake up and stop it, man. You need to repent and turn. And I'm glad that a lot of the people that, that commented to this open prayer of his request were pretty much like that. Well, you're in sin, brother. You need to get out of it. Go marry her right now and then live with her and suffer the consequences because of it. <laughs> hey, you know that that's biblical. That's biblical. You go to the Old Testament and it, remember how sometimes it talks about um, men who lay with women and, and the suggestion is it's rape sometimes. And it does say that if you find that man, you go and you get him and he marries her and he's stuck with her. Whether he likes it or not. You know, because that's how committed God was to the institution of, of marriage you know, and so forth. Some guys just like, phew, phew, go right, right on. Phew, phew, phew. Like, man, wake up, open your eyes. You got your glasses on, but you don't see. You know, so many people are, are able to see physically, but they're so blind. And yet there are those that are blind that can see. Yeah, that's wonderful how God is. But they have walked according to the dictates of their own heart and after Baal. I mean, it almost sounds like it. Do what your heart is leading you to do. Isn't that dictate? Your heart kind of has this little, no, my heart's telling me to do this. It's like dictating to me, and so I'm just going to follow my heart. Because where my heart is, there's my, my treasures. That's what the Bible says. And so if your heart's in the wrong direction, then you got the wrong treasures. You, know, you need to judge your heart with the word of God. So their heart dictated their, their own ways, and after Baal, which their fathers taught them, therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will feed them, this people, with wormwood, and give them water of gold to drink. And I will scatter them also among the Gentiles whom neither they nor their fathers have known. And I will send a sword after them until I have consumed them. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider and call for the mourning women. Now, these are women that you go and hire and you have them mourn for you because no one else is mourning. And so at least you got someone mourning. Uh, and then basically that's, that's how worse it is that they may come and send a skillful wailing woman, that they may come. He let them make haste and take up a wailing for us that our eyes may run with tears and our eyelids gush from, with water. For a voice of wailing is heard in Zion, how we are plundered, we are greatly ashamed because we have forsaken the land, because we have been cast out of our dwelling. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O woman, and let your ear receive the word of his mouth. Teach your daughters wailing, and everyone her neighbor a lamentation. For death has come through our windows, has entered our places to kill off the children, no longer to be outside, the young men no longer on the streets. Speak thus, says the Lord, even the carcasses of men shall fall as refuge on the open field like cuttings after the harvesters. And no one shall gather them. I mean, the carnage. You know, usually when you harvest the fields, you know, you had either machines or animals and they're cutting the harvest and they're bringing up all the all the, the wheat or the barley, whatever it is, and they're bundling up and there's always stuff that falls to the side. There's always stuff that falls to the side. And that's how they took care of their poor and that's where Ruth uh, would come along and pick up the stuff that fell to the wayside and that's how they were fed and so forth. Well, in this case, he uses it as an analogy of the carnage when the Lord brings a sword to them. Verse 23, to close up. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. Now those are wonderful things. If you have all wisdom, 
Isn't it a wonderful thing to walk around and say, I've got wisdom. You ought to listen to me. Yeah, yeah you're glorying in your wisdom. I know how to do that. I've got the answer. I've got the way. God has given me wisdom. He's given me knowledge and understanding. And guess what? I know how to apply it. That's wisdom. And we glory in it. And the Lord says, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Even the wisest of men should understand that if they have wisdom and if it works, glory be to God and not to us. Let the mighty man not glory in his might. It's good to have strength, right? I mean, we see it all over today. Is it MAA? MAA? M-O-I-A? What's that? M- ultimate fighters? Arr, strength, you know, the ultimate guy. I was watching uh, a program with this, this one guy. He's like a, a bull. And he's just like, you know, and boom, they go down. And it's like he hasn't lost a fight yet. That's strength. That's might. That's power. And men glory in that, you know? It's like, I'm the best. Nobody can beat me. I'm the strongest. Don't even think about it. I'll knock you down on your butt, you know? I mean, that's glorying in in your own power and strength. You know, I think of my injury because I thought I was a strong person. And now, man, I worry. I go, don't touch me. I'll fall over. It's just like, I know I, I know I don't look like that, you know, and I have to keep that image, especially when you're a bunch of, uh, around a bunch of guys, you know, and so forth. And you, may, you let them know you're weak and they'll just jump on you. So you've got to walk around like you're strong, but if they touch you or breathe on you, I fall over. And, you know, I will die. I have no strength at all. One, one push and I, bit, you know, put all my weight on this side of the, my body and that's it, I'm done with, you know. And I've thought about that many, many times. As a man, it's a man thing. You know, you go into the bank, okay, I've got to fight my way out of here, so I've got to look for the exits, you know, and all that stuff. Someone comes in with a gun, going to rob the store, and, you know. I mean, you think about all these things as a man. That's what happens in our minds, ladies, you know. And we go to a restaurant, it's like, we sit here because if something, one comes in, you get under the table. I'm thinking of all these things, you know. And I'm thinking, boy, just one push, I'm done, I'm over, she's dead. <laughs> you know? I can't do anything. But we glory in that might, right? Or in our riches, he says, don't glory in your riches. You know, so many people glory in their riches. You know, why? They like to drive around the nicest cars, the biggest chain medallions, you know, and the leather coats and all of that stuff and the little hats. And it's like, I'm a rich man. I can have anything I want. And it can be taken away like that. But what does Jeremiah say? But let him who glories glory in this, that he understand and knows me. Or God says that. That's glory. That you know me. That you know God. Not a lot of people can say that when you think about it. Think about before you knew God. And you knew there was a God, but you didn't know God. Now I know God. I know what he sounds like. I know what he smells like. I know what he likes. I really know God. That's like saying, I know the President of the United States. I've had chicken with him. He'd never have chicken with me. But I know God. That's amazing when you think about it. You're talking about the creator of the heavens and the earth who spoke everything into existence. I know him. When there was nothing at all, he, that's the guy I know. That's the God I know. That's something to glory about. That's something to boast about. That God opened my mind to understand that there is a God. Because there are a lot of people that are walking around thinking they're gods, that their riches are gods, that their might is God or their wisdom is God. No, if you want to glory, glory that you understand and know him. That is amazing, that I am the Lord. This is how you know him, exercising loving kindness, judgment or fairness and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, saith the Lord. Do you know the loving kindness of the Lord? amazing how loving he is to save a wretch like me. (laughs) Amazing that he would consider to even accept me into the kingdom of God because he really shouldn't. By all means, he should be rejecting me and kicking me out. But his loving kindness, that he would still welcome me in to the kingdom of God. That's love and kind. 
That's the God that we serve. And his judgment or his fairness, that he's fair. He doesn't play sides. He understands he's going to do the right thing for us and righteousness on the earth. And he delights in these things. That's something to glory about, that you know him. Behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord, that I will punish all who are circumcised with the uncircumcised. You see, it's not religion. It's not whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised. And we all know what circumcision is. It's a very painful covenant that God had with Abraham. And it was to remind them of the covenant that God made with them. And then Paul comes along and says, that's useless. Because God doesn't want the circumcision of the foreskin. He wants it of the heart of the heart because whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised God says I'll consume you both what I want is a heart a contrite spirit that's what the Lord wants before him Egypt, Judah, Edom the people of Ammon, Moab and all who are in the furthest corners who dwell in the wilderness for all these nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are are uncircumcised in heart So what is he talking about? The heart. God wants to get to the heart of the matter. He wants your heart. He loves your soul. He loves your spirit. He loves you. It's not your works of righteousness or your acts. It's just his grace. And you're receiving that grace. Freely and willfully saying, thank you, Lord, for being gracious to a wretched sinner like me. I think it was William Booth who said that um, every man and woman should be taken by the boots, tied up, and hang them over hell for just a little bit so they understand what God has saved them from. Saved us from a lot. Do you understand and know him? Do you understand? Can you say, I know God? Can you say, I obey God? I believe in his word and I want to be obedient to it.